My text is in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 3, verse 14, and then verse 18. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Verse 18 says, He who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. I want to minister to you on a subject that is often never addressed. And that is the Son of Man and the Son of God. The Son of Man and the Son of God. Let's pray. Father, give us a spirit of revelation and wisdom and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let it be a word that resonates in our spirit and plants good seed that will bring forth fruit. Open our ears to hear. We ask it now in your precious name and everyone said, Amen. Amen. I am what I was. I was not what I am now. But now I'm called both. What am I saying? I am what I was, the Son of God. I was not what I am now, the Son of Man. But now I'm called both the Son of God, and the Son of Man. In that simple syllogism, we have summarized two names of Jesus that we find in the Scripture. The Son of God and the Son of Man. Say that with me. The Son of God and the Son of Man. Last week, we looked at the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I pray that that was revelation. For me, it was amazing. And these two names given to Jesus are also very staggering in their meaning and in their impact and in their relevance to our lives. When you talk about Jesus being the Son of God and Jesus being the Son of Man, we are talking about him equally partaking of two natures. Equally. The word son does not refer to the fact of origin from a previous source, although that is true of his humanity. But the word son refers to the sharing of the same nature and the fulfilling of a particular task or role. So the Bible declares that Jesus is both the Son of God and the Son of Man equally. That is, that he has a divine nature as the Son of God, and he also has a human nature as the Son of Man. And what's unique is that both natures are resident in one person at the same time, the person of Jesus. To be the Son of God means he has a divine nature. To have a divine nature means he has to have divine attributes. So the attributes that make God God, Jesus possesses. And so all that is true of God is true of Jesus because Jesus has God's nature. Can you say amen to that? God is omnipotent, God is omniscient, God is great in love and great in mercy and great in justice and great in grace and great in wrath. And we could go on and on and on. But all of those things are true of God. Since Jesus has God's nature, Jesus possesses all of his attributes. One of the other aspects of God's nature is his eternal existence. There's never been a time when God has not been and Jesus as the word of God bears his nature. So Jesus also is eternal as God is, 
which is why when we look at Jesus as the word of God, you could say for him in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, and the word was made flesh. Jesus has always been eternal, first being the word before taking the form of a man. So all that makes God, God is resident in Jesus. Are we on the same page? But not only is Jesus the son of God, he is the son of man. So all that make human beings, human beings is resident in Jesus apart from sin. He got tired like other human beings get tired. He had to sleep like other human beings have to sleep. He has to eat like other human beings has got to get nutrition from their food. He had to weep because people weep. All of these things he did just like any other human being because people weep, people cry, people eat, people need food. And he had to be tempted by the devil because temptation is what the devil does to human beings. Amen? Amen. Anybody here that is not tempted on some regular basis, may I see your hand? Because if you raise your hand, I'd say you're probably walking with the devil, not against him. Because Satan tempts. <laughs> you will never come to a place that you will not experience temptation. All the things that make people human, Jesus possesses in his humanity, but he possesses it apart from sin. So how could Jesus be fully God, bearing all the attributes of deity, and at the same time fully man, bearing all the attributes of humanity. How could both be side by side in one person? And the answer to that is the virgin birth. The Bible says the seed of a woman, Mary, was fertilized by the sperm of the Holy Spirit. And that Joseph was not a part of that process, but Mary, being a virgin, found herself pregnant by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, of course, is the third member of the Trinity. He is God. So it is God who impregnates a woman by fertilizing her egg, and uh, a woman is human. So her humanity and God's deity came together to create a most unique person ever to enter human history or to enter the human race. Are we still on the same page? And that is the person of Jesus Christ so that he could be called the son of God at the same time he could be called the son of man because both natures were resident in one person made possible by the virgin birth. Now, here's a question. Since Mary is a sinner and since Jesus is human, bearing half of Mary's DNA, not her blood, but half of her DNA from Mary, how did sin keep from getting into Jesus? Since Mary is human like every other sinful person because we are born and shaped in iniquity and sin, right? It was the role of the Holy Spirit to not only fertilize Mary's egg, but to protect the human nature of Mary from transferring into Jesus. In other words, Mary's sin nature did not transfer over to Jesus because it was the Holy Spirit's job to provide not only divine substance for Jesus' human birth, but to provide his divine protection. So when the birth took place, the sin nature did not transfer with it. Are we still on the same page? Uh, let me explain that. I feel the need to explain that. Let me explain it by a comparison. The reason that you can trust the Bible in the being the inerrant word of God, that it was recorded and in, in, uh, inspired without any human error. How can we know that there's no human error in this, the Bible? Even though men were involved in the writing of it, we know that because the Bible says that the Holy Spirit oversaw those who were writing the words to make sure that while he covered their writing, nothing got in there that shouldn't be in there and nothing was left out that should have been included. It was the protection of the Holy Spirit 
that makes the Bible inerrant, the word of God, without error. Likewise, the reason Jesus had no sin is because the Holy Spirit oversaw that the sin nature was not transferred to Jesus Christ. Still on the same page. So just as the Holy Spirit protected Jesus from having sin in his humanity, the same Holy Spirit protected the Bible from having any errors being transferred in it. And that is why we can have confidence that in both the living and the written word of God, so what we have now is Jesus being the son of God and at the same time being the son of man equally the same. He's as much son of man as he is son of God. Hmm. But he is called something unique. He is called the only begotten son of God, not son of man. He is the only begotten son of God. Only begotten means uniquely, one of a kind, a class by itself. Nobody like him. There's only one of him. That's why you can't have multiple deities. That's why you can't have more than one Jesus. He is the only begotten son of God. Because Jesus only has Father God and he has the Holy Spirit of God and the Father has only one of a kind son and you have the Holy Spirit, all three being totally different personalities, but all being one God. But only one part of the Godhead has both Son of God and Son of Man. The Father doesn't possess that. The Holy Spirit does not possess that. Are we on the same page? I am simply laying a foundation to get to something deep. And so the Son is the only one who is both the Son of God, Son of Man. All right, in John chapter 5, verse 18, the Jewish leaders clearly understood what Jesus was saying when he called God his Father. In fact, he does that throughout his entire ministry. And uh, it says that when they heard him say that God was his father, it says they sought more than ever to kill him because he made himself equal with God. In other words, they totally understood that when he said God was his father, he was in effect saying, I have God's nature. You can't have God's nature and not be God. And so they tried to kill him because he put himself as God. But there's another concept of the word son. Son is sourced in the nature from which it derives. Jesus has divine nature. Jesus has human nature. They are totally unmixed. They are walking side by side in one person. That's why at one moment Jesus could be hungry and the next moment he could be in the mountain of transfiguration. A God side, a human side. One moment he could die, a human side. The next moment he could be raised from the dead, a God side. Because you got two natures operating side by side in one person. So in addition to the two natures, the word son, this is important, indicates a function. For example, under my ministry, I have sons and daughters in the ministry. They're not my biological children, but I am a spiritual father to them. I call them sons, I call them daughters, not because there's a biological attachment, but because there is a ministry function that they have between me and them, a ministry function. Paul called Timothy his son in the ministry. He was not Paul's biological son, but he was his ministerial son and especially designed, hear this, designed to fulfill a ministerial responsibility. So sons and daughters have a ministerial responsibility. The son of God, son of man, has a ministerial responsibility. So when you refer to Jesus as the son of God and the son of man, he not only possesses the nature of both, but he is carrying the responsibility for both. Have you ever thought about that? What does that mean? He is fulfilling a job description on behalf of God his Father. 
There is something that his father wants him to do. But on the other side, he is fulfilling a responsibility on behalf of you and in behalf of me. So as the son of God, he is feeling, fulfilling what the father tells him to do. And as the son of man, he is fulfilling what you need done for you. Still on the same page? So as a, all foundation, as a result, he can do both in one person because one person has both operating inside of him. So when you and I talk about Jesus, we talk about a whole lot more than just the name. We're talking about two natures and two ministerial responsibilities residing in one person equally. Now that I finish my introduction, I'm ready to get into deeper waters. We together? Do we need to stand for a moment? No, just give God a clap offering. I love it from here on. I worked hard to get here. Do you remember Philip in John chapter 14, verses 7 through 11? Let me condense it. Philip comes to Jesus being one of the 12 for some time now, and Philip says, when are we going to see the Father? And Jesus says to him, have I been with you so long and you still don't get it? When you've seen me, you have seen the Father. And they still did not get it that Christ was not merely a mere man. He was God in flesh. So to see Jesus is to literally look at the face of God. Are you hearing me? So to see Jesus, you are seeing the Father. And you have to understand this where I'm wanting to get ready to take you. If you don't understand that Jesus totally gives us a visual of the Father, then you just don't understand that he is deity, that he is God in flesh. And so if you want to understand what God is like, just simply look at Jesus. Now, the Bible says in Hebrews 1, 3, that Jesus is the exact replica of God. What does that mean? Jesus is like taking a selfie of God himself. You want to see what God looks like? Here, look at this picture. This is what God looks like. And so Jesus comes into the world, okay? So God's got a selfie of himself so that we can get a visual of God. And so the question is, why? Why these two names in this one person? Why? I'm going to take many hours that I've spent studying this last week to try to condense it in a few moments. But I pray hopefully you will want more. Let me boil it down to this. God has a plan. Not many plans. God has one plan. The whole Bible is about one plan. And that plan is all about his kingdom. That's his plan. God has a kingdom up there. It is called the kingdom of heaven. And there is a kingdom up there where he rules. And before man was ever on the earth, there was a rebellion against the kingdom up there by Lucifer who became Satan. He rebelled against God and God decided to have a plan. Listen closely. What is his plan? He wants to create a lesser creature, an inferior creature. Psalms 8 says he made man a little lower than the angels. Now, constitutionally, you and I are inferior to angels. We don't fly like angels. We don't disappear like angels. We don't have the mentality of angels. We don't have the strength of angels. We are lower or we are inferior to angels. We were made lower than the angels. And God decided that he would make a creature lesser than the angelic being. And that creature would be mankind. And he would create this lesser creature to demonstrate what he could do with less when less was dependent upon him 
than he could do with more when more was in rebellion against him. I'm going to show everybody something. I'm going to create something inferior, but when that which is inferior is dependent upon me, it can do more than that which is greater can do in their rebellion. So he created an inferior being, Adam, and he placed him on the third planet from the sun. And he says, now, Adam, I want you, Adam, to establish my kingdom on earth. How? Like it is in heaven. You remember the Lord's prayer? Thy kingdom come. How? Thy will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. So God's plan is he wants on earth to have things happen like they happen in heaven. God wants his kingdom on earth like it is in heaven. Are we together? The problem with God's plan, really not a problem, but God in this plan restricts himself. My kingdom will work down there like it works up here, but it can only work through mankind. I will not do it apart from man. So God has restricted himself. I can only do this, bring my kingdom to earth, if I do it through mankind. I cannot do it by myself. I restrict myself. He will only work through man. So he tells Adam, look, Adam, every tree in the garden belongs to you. Eat freely of everything but the tree in the midst of the garden. Don't touch it. If you eat of that, you will die. So we know the story. Satan dupes Eve and Eve pressures Adam. And Adam eats as well as Eve has eaten. So Adam and Eve has now fallen. And they have handed the world and all that is in it to Satan. And so the kingdoms of this world now belong to the devil. I did not say the earth belongs to the devil. That is not scriptural. But the kingdoms of this world belong to Satan. That's why the Bible says this world lies in the hands of the wicked one. So Satan owns this world and Satan owns the systems of this world uh, because Adam fell and handed it to him, gave it to him. Are we still together? Problem is God says, I want it back. And uh, I want it to become the kingdom on earth like it is in heaven. And Psalms 24 teaches very clearly, he owns the earth but not the world's. But to get his world back, God cannot do it directly because he restricts himself. I can only do this through a lesser creature, man. That means he had to find a man who qualifies and could do it. But every man born since Adam failed. Every man born since Adam did not meet God's righteous standard to be the one through whom God could reclaim the world and bring the kingdom up there and manifest it down here. Are we still on the same page? Yes. So God gives us a prophecy. Genesis chapter 3, 15. And he says that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the devil. Now, it's got to be a human being. But it's an interesting prophecy because when it comes to childbirth, it's the man that has the seed and the woman that has the egg. Am I right biologically? Thank you. But since God knew in advance that the one he was talking about would not have a human father, he gives the woman the seed. How does he give the woman the seed? By the Holy Spirit. So that the man who is born can crush the head of the devil because it is now going to come through a human being. So Eve is given the seed, not by a man, but by the Holy Spirit. So the seed of the woman, it's a gift to her. Are you with that? And so because of that, and the seed has no sin because of the Holy Spirit, this that will be born is qualified to bring God's kingdom from heaven to earth. And all through his ministry, Jesus keeps saying, the kingdom of heaven 
is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is now. The kingdom of heaven is here. So what God decided to do basically was to become a man and the deity of heaven entered the egg of a woman. So now we've got a man without sin because he is the God man. So that's why you've got a dual name. He's the son of God, he's the son of man, and he's come to reclaim what the devil has stolen. But he did not just come, oh God, hear this. He did not just come to reclaim what Adam lost. He has come to reclaim what you have lost. What do you mean by that? The devil has been ripping us off all of us in every category of life. He is the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He is, in effect, the rip-off artist. And this is why I love Hebrews 2, 14 through 15. Listen closely. Inasmuch then as the children have become partakers of flesh and blood, in himself likewise. You have, you're human. you got flesh and blood. Jesus is human. He's got flesh and blood. So he himself likewise shared in the same. Why did he have to become a man? That through death, everyone say death, death, he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. The devil never figured this out. God had to become a man, son of man. Why? Because only a man can die. And if the man will die, he can destroy the devil. Are you with that? So God takes on the form of a man because only a man can die. You cannot kill a spirit. And so what goes down into hell is the soul of man. All right? As a man. So he has to die. The purpose in the death of Christ Jesus is so extremely important because he has a mission. What's his mission? I'm going to die so I can go to hell and destroy Satan. Absolutely destroy all of hell. I'm going to wipe it out. I'm going to beat up everybody. I'm going to, all of hell is going to watch me not just destroy them and kill principalities, not kill, but beat up principalities and powers. Finally, I will take all the authority that Satan has himself and I will make an open shame of all of hell to render powerless the authority of the devil. And then I will free people, reading the scripture, to fulfill the purpose for him. For the purpose he put man here in the first place is so Jesus had to die so the devil would no longer have any claims on you or any other person. Which means if the devil has any claim on anybody here, you are either not saved and born again, or you don't understand what it means to be saved and born again. Because the reason Jesus died was to take the handcuffs off of you by taking the keys away from the devil who held you hostage. He says he died to set you free from the power of the devil, and that the only way Christians can be incarcerated by the devil is by trickery through deception. And so if you are not victorious, it's because he has tricked you, you're deceived, or you're not born again. It's either or. Turn to someone and say, I think he's talking to you. So the devil only has to make you think that you're not free and so that you will not function like you're free because he's kept you from understanding what the death of Jesus was designed to accomplish. Most of us, most Christians have a very limited concept uh, 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 of the death of Jesus. Most Christians believe that Jesus was a man, he died, and the reason he had to die and then be raised from the dead so he could lead us to heaven. Well, yes and no. He died, yes, to take you to heaven, but he also died and he rose again, more importantly, to bring heaven to you. And like him, for you to render powerless the authority of the devil. He has given you authority and power over everything. And he's given you carte blanche, the power of attorney for his name. 
There is nothing that has more power than his name. And so what stops you from taking heaven and bringing it to earth is only your level of lack of revelation. Hmm. You are tricked. Satan can no longer own anyone that has been delivered from the hostage of being controlled by Satan. Jesus set you free. When you accept him as Lord and Savior, you're free. Never to be held hostage again. He has no power to incarcerate you. This is why Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 for unto us, you might want to take note of this, Justin, Christ is born. Unto us, a son is given. We sing that at Christmas. Now, maybe you've never thought about this, but the son was not born. The child is born unto us. The son is given because the son existed before the child was ever born. The child had to be born, and when the child was born, then the son entered into the birth of the child. So the son is given, the child must be born. Are you with me? So the son could only be given because the son was already eternally with God and was God. Not the son, not the child. The, the, the child was born and the son was given. I don't know why I felt to explain that, but I did. Let me get to some better parts. And so the son was just handed over in the birth process for the birth of a child. And when you understand this, you can understand that Jesus is the fulfillment of the expectation of all of human history and the human race. That there would be a man, a human, who would bring God's kingdom to earth. And that's why Paul calls him the last Adam, because the first Adam messed up, but the last Adam brought us back into God's kingdom kingdom. Now, here's where I have a problem with a lot of believers. And he brought the kingdom to earth. Did Jesus bring the kingdom to earth? Yes, the kingdom's at hand. He constantly talks about the kingdom. So you're not just saved to go to heaven. You are saved to live in God's kingdom here on earth. Get this. He saved you for a kingdom purpose in time. And he saved you for an eternal purpose in eternity. But while you are in time, you must fulfill your kingdom purpose or you will not have much of an eternal purpose. Hello. So get this. You were saved for something now, for a kingdom purpose now. This is where I have a problem. I would just like Christians to have the revelation that when they are born again, yes, they have gone through the door of the kingdom. But then once you go through the door, help me, Lord, you are supposed to be living in the kingdom realm and in the kingdom atmosphere. But I find that so many Christians are so overwhelmed about trying to go to heaven that we brag about how nice the door is. Oh, I've gone through the door. Jesus is the way. Jesus said, I am the door. We got through the door. Come on. There's more to the house than the door. There's a living room, a bedroom, closets, dining. There's all kind of stuff in the kingdom of God. And you're just talking about you got through the door. Who cares? Yes, it's important. But if you're not living in the realms of the kingdom now, then what are you here for? There's a whole lot of stuff to the kingdom than just getting in. I'm saved and born again. Great, you've just started the process. So why brag about that? You've got a long way to go. Just getting to the door is a starting process. Well, I'm through the door and I'm on my way to heaven. Wrong mentality. God brought you in the door for something bigger than the door. You were brought into his realm, the realm where the impossible becomes possible. 
This is the realm. I'm talking about the kingdom of God, whether it be in heaven or be on earth. I'm talking about entering into the kingdom, into his authority, into his power, into his fullness, into his fruitfulness, into the miracle of his multiplying. I'm talking about entering into his dominion on earth. That's what you're supposed to be operating in now with the son of God and the son of man. Watch this. When you accepted Jesus, have you ever understood that when Jesus through the Holy Spirit of Christ came in you, he came in you as the son of God and as the son of man. So I'm saying that if you have the spirit of Christ inside of you, you have the son of God and you have the son of man. Now that's very important because you have two realities operating inside of you. In one person, you have the son of God. The other person, you have the son of man. That means that deity can operate inside of you. But also you have the son of man without sin inside of you. So you have somebody in you who can tell you how humanity is supposed to be operating within you. He will not only tell you how to get God activated, but how to get you activated because he's human and he's perfect humanity. Therefore, he's human to the max, which means that he is much better at humanity than you will ever be because he has no sin. And so he knows what to do to make you the best human that you could ever be. And so if you'll listen to him, the son of man will make you so powerful in the son of man part of your life that it will blow your mind. If you will just listen to how he directs you. Of course, if you think you can be a perfect human greater than him and you want to lead yourself, you will screw it all up. Because you've already messed up by having sin in your life. We never tap in to the humanity of God within us. Hmm. I could spend a long time there. Let me move on. A lot of people don't know this. When Jesus talks about God, he will never call him God. He always says, my father, my father, my father, my father. My. He always, have you ever asked why? Why does Jesus refuse to call God, God? Why does Jesus always refer to God as his father? I think that's a very important question. Hmm. He says, when you pray, pray our Father. You never pray, God, I want you to do. No, 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 no. Our Father. A lot of you pray wrong. And you have to understand the significance. The only time, the only exception where Jesus ever calls God, God, is on the cross. Where he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So the one time Jesus calls God, God, and not his father is when sin is now taking over his entire being. He is dying on the cross for our sin. Sin is taking over and all of a sudden he's not saying daddy and father. Nah, -uh. he's saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why is he saying that? I can't find you. The relationship is gone. The relationship is broken. We're no longer in fellowship one with another. We have been separated because the sin of the world is being laid on me and I'm bearing it. So I cannot call you father because I cannot sense you. I have no relationship with you. I am separated. I can't find you. And so I call you God because now God you're that big universal deity who only created the heavens and the earth. There's no intimacy. Hmm. The point I'm trying to make should be clear. It means the closer you get to Jesus, 
the more you feel the Father. The further you get from Jesus, you are just left with God without any intimacy. All you have is this high view of God, but not this intimate sense of the Father. Jesus wants you to have the same intimacy with his daddy that he had, but he couldn't have it as long as sin was in the picture. Once, do you understand what I'm saying? In other words, just, just tell me how you pray. Do you always pray our Father that comes out of your mouth naturally, or do you pray God? If you do, you do not have intimacy with Christ. You want me to back that up in the scripture? I can see I've made the place quiet. You're having just the image of God is a horrible perception. At best, it is religion, and God hates religion because God is only into relationship and nothing less. What kind of relationship? He wants to be your father like he was to Jesus. Jesus simply explains to everyone around him, look, uh, 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 my daddy, when he works, I work. When my daddy rolls, I roll like my daddy rolls. He does this thing, I do that thing. When he says something, I say what he says when he says it. In other words, I'm trying to tell you that when my daddy is, whatever he's thinking, I'm thinking the same thing as him. I roll with my daddy. I say what he says, I do what he does. I am totally connected so much into him in my function that you don't see me, you can only see him because I am the face of my daddy. He's not just God, but he's my father. This is why Philippians 3 says, when we're in fellowship with him, who? Jesus. We cry, Abba, Father. You don't ever cry, God. If you're not crying, Abba, Father, you're not in fellowship at the level that Jesus expects you to be in with him. If you're in, see, that's what, that's what the Bible says. When you're in fellowship the right way with Jesus, you have to cry, Abba, Father. You're not getting this. The, men, and the reason many of us are not experiencing more of God is because he is just God to us. And it clearly shows you're not in proper relationship with Christ inside of you. Hmm. Romans 8, 28 and 29 says, All things work together for good to them who love God and are called according to his purpose. And then it says, And who are conformed to the image of his son. In other words, things only work together for the good that God has if you have been conformed to his image. In other words, when I see you, I'm supposed to see him. Just like when they saw Jesus, they were supposed to see the father. If I'm looking at you and I don't see Jesus, that is simply because you have not been conformed you don't want to hear the Galatians 4, 4 and 5 says this. Then at the right time, Jesus Christ came into the world. Why? For the adoption of many sons. God does not want Jesus to be an only child. Did you hear that? God only begotten. Begotten means one of a kind. But God never wants Jesus to be an only child. He's a unique child, a unique son, but he is never to be an only child because he has been called to replicate himself over and over and over and over and over again. You are to be conformed to him. You are to look more and more like him. He is not to be, you are to be a son of God, a daughter of God, just like Jesus is a son of God. You are to look and be conformed like him. If you are not, then obviously you don't know the father as father. Hmm. I could get into that for a long time. I'd like to get into where I really like it. All right? <laughs> so let me jump ahead. Let me go to John chapter 1. You may want to check this out, verse 45. Watch this. I love this. I usually have never heard this really explained. 
John 1, 45, and I'm going to go to verse 51. Philip found Nathanael, and he said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote, because the whole Old Testament was writing about this one who will come. And it's Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. He is Joseph's stepson. And so Nathanael responds to Philip, and he says, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? So obviously Nazareth has a bad reputation. And Philip says, Come and see. Come and see for yourself. Now, Jesus sees Nathanael coming to him, and he says to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. King James says guile. New King James says deceit. So Nathanael comes to Jesus, and Jesus identifies him. You are an Israelite. You have got a great character. Nathanael responds to Jesus. He says, Well, how do you know me? I mean, you act like you know me. We've never met. How do you know me? Jesus then answers and says to him, before Philip called you, you were under the fig tree and I saw you. Okay, stay with me because it starts to get heavy. Number one, Jesus says, behold, an Israelite, indeed, whom there is no deceit. Nathaniel says, look, we've never met. How do you know me? How do I know you? Number two, Jesus said, before Philip ever went to you, found you, you were under a fig tree and I saw you. In other words, I have knowledge about you. I not only know your character, I know where you were sitting underneath the fig tree and I knew that before Philip ever found you, I got inside information on you, Nate. I know all about you, Nate. I know you. Stay with me. So when Nathaniel hears Jesus say this, tells him all this information about himself that he shouldn't have known. Listen to Nathaniel's response. I love this. Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And you are God in the flesh. And you are the prophesied king and the Old Testament has promised would come. He is simply saying, you are what Daniel 7, 13 and 14 says. That the Ancient of Days is the Father who would be a son of man who would come and reign as king and have dominion. So they know this prophecy. And Nathaniel is saying, this is you. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. And so Nathaniel says, you're it. You are the son of God. Say it with me. You are. Nathaniel says, you are. What? He says, you're what? Jesus, you are the? Great. Now that's important because Jesus said, I saw you under the fig tree. Watch this. And because you believed me based on what I said to you, <coughs> excuse me, I haven't shown you anything yet. All I did was say a few words. I talked to you, but you believed my word and you believed what I said, so you will see greater things than these. Translation, you ain't seen nothing yet. Because you believed what I said, simply because I had some information about you. Now, let's get deeper. Not only did I tell you where you were, and I told you what your character was, but I also told you, Nathaniel, what you were thinking. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, where do you get that in these verses? Listen to what he says. Behold, an Israelite with no deceit. And then he says, verse 51, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels ascending and descending. Where? On the Son of Man. Don't miss this. This goes all the way back to Genesis 28. When Jacob is under a tree, he sees a ladder come down from heaven and the angels are going up and down the ladder, bringing earth to heaven and uh, heaven to earth. But Jacob is just the opposite. He's a man full of deceit and full of guile. In fact, his name means deceiver. All right? So let me tell you what Jesus is telling Nathaniel. Here's what he's saying that we don't, we don't understand. He says, look, I saw you under a fig tree. And under the fig tree, you were having devotions. 
and you were having devotions and you were reading Genesis 28. And in Genesis 28, it talked about a deceitful man who saw the heavens open and saw angels going up and down this ladder. And you were reading this passage and you were thinking about that. I saw you under the fig tree. I don't only know who you are. I know what you were reading and I know what you were thinking because you were thinking about Jacob's ladder. Jesus is telling Nathaniel because you confess that I am the son of God because you've accepted my deity, you will see, watch this, the son of not God. Jesus switches it. Because you believed what I said, you will see the son of man. Don't miss this. Jesus doesn't take the phrase son of God. He switches it. You will see the son of man. I'm going to show you what a man can do. Why? Because you recognize my deity. You will watch my humanity go to work and blow your mind. Can I go deeper? So verse 51, I say unto you truly, truly, sure enough, sure enough, I say unto you truly, truly, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending, descending, not on Jacob's ladder in the Old Testament, but you will see the angels descending on the son of man, not God. New Testament. So Jesus is Jacob's ladder and the angels will ascend and descend on the son of man. Nathan's revelation is he's the son of God because you have this revelation, you're gonna see what the son of man can do. Can we go deeper? You're gonna see the heavens open. Now I know we got some people in here who have been wanting the heavens to open. You've been wanting to see some things up there, but you need to be down here and the son of man show you something down here. Forget seeing something up there. God, I know you're real up there, but I really need you to do some things down here. I need heaven to open up there, but I need to see some angels down here. I want some angels to do some stuff on the Son of Man down here because the kingdom is down here. And so what are the angels? Well, the angels are God's post office. I know you can't see them, but they are God's delivery service, right? Hebrews 1.14, every believer has been assigned an angel. So you have an angel who has been personally assigned and deputized and delegated to cover your life specifically in the will of God for you. The job of the messenger service that we call angels are, let's put it this way, they are your Uber drivers designed to take you into the will of God so that you get to see heaven open up and heaven delivers something to earth that you are needing to see in your life experience. You have an angel, and that angel picks up requests from earth, delivers them to heaven, picks up the answers from heaven, and delivers them to earth for you. But he only does it on the Son of Man, because the Son of Man is the latter. Can I get deeper? Thank you. So if you've got Jesus way up there, but you don't relate to Jesus down here day to day. You only got the son of God, but you are not benefiting from the son of man who wants to show you some stuff sure enough right down here. He wants to open the heavens. Oh God, oh God. You're not getting in history what is designed for him to deliver to you through the angels. Uh, let me give you a Greek lesson here. Verse 51. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open. Who's he talking to? Nathaniel. The Greek lesson I want to give to you is on the word you. In the Greek, that word you is plural, not singular. So he's only talking to Nathaniel. He says, Nathaniel, because you declared who I was, then you all will see the heavens open. In other words, he just included us, people. It's not just innate. It's to all of us because in the Greek, that second you is not singular. It is plural. It includes us. You will see the heaven. Oh, God, help me. Huh. Where to go? 
If Jesus Christ is your connecting point from your history to heaven, and when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, starts to work, when the Son of God starts to work, how will he work? He, you will see the Son of Man do the work. Because I tried to teach this last week. Jesus functions as a man, not the Son of God. On earth, he functions as a man. Okay, let's close this thing up. Let me close it up. This is chapter 1. We took it to the end. So how are we going to see heaven open in this ladder, which is Jesus, the son of man, not God? How's God going to open the heavens where he can take angels that are for us? You've been, an, you have an angel. You do understand that some of us have more than one angel. I'd like to think I've got more than one. All right. How are they going to get stuff to me? How am I going to see the heavens open? How am I going to see the son of man do exploits that will blow my mind. Well, let's start by going to chapter 2. So in chapter 2 of John, he takes the same disciples who were there in chapter 1, and they're all invited to a wedding. And so why are they at the wedding? Because Jesus is a social creature. He got the invitation. He accepted it. And uh, the disciples are going to go where he goes. Now, at the wedding, you know the story. They run out of wine. And some of you know real good what it feels like to run out of wine. <laughs> and wine in the Bible is used for celebrations. So when it's used positively, we hit glasses and we make toasts, and especially we do this at weddings. So when there is no wine, there is no celebration because the wine represents our joy and it represents our celebration. Are we on the same page? Good. So Jesus' mother comes over to him in chapter 2 and says, we don't have any wine, we've run out. And Jesus knew immediately what she meant. She is basically, son, show them who you is. Come on, son, I know who you are, but I want you to strut your stuff. Show them. And Jesus says, woman, my time has not yet come. In other words, it's not time for me to go public. Now, I'm, I'm not going to go public. I, I refuse to do that in this situation, but I promise I'm going to do something. Now, watch this. Then he tells the servants, well, she tells the servants to do whatever he says, and so he tells the servants, go get these six barrels, some translations, others water pots, and uh, fill them up with water. Now, they're either 20 gallons of water pot or 30 gallons, so it's somewhere between 120 and 180 gallons, all right? And uh, so go fill them up with water and take them to the master of the feast. And while they are walking with the water, it turns into wine. They don't bring it back to Jesus. Now, did anyone notice Jesus never prayed for the water to turn into wine? All he did was tell the servants to take it to the master, which is the head waiter. All right, so watch this. Jesus doesn't command the water or anything. He just says while they're working. So they are doing what he told them to do. Is that right? They filled up the water pots with water. They are walking it to the head waiter over the wedding. And uh, here's our problem. So you're following Jesus. You got no wine. I can't, I can't reveal my ministry publicly yet, but I will do something, Mom. Servants are told by the mom, do what he says. Go get these water pots. Now, that, how many know that 20 or 30 gallons is pretty heavy? And so I don't know how many servants he had, but they are told to fill it up with water and take it to the head waiter. And so they just pick up the water and they're carrying it to the head waiter. They probably don't even know themselves if the water is turned into wine. All right? Are you with that? If that was you, and you knew that you'd run out of wine. And Jesus said, go fill the water pots up with water. Water? What do we need water for? Don't you understand? We're out of wine. We don't need any water. Why are you asking for water? We don't, water's not going to help us. We need some wine. See, you would be totally rebellious. 
In fact, the reason many of you don't see the heavens open and see the man working the miracles is because you are disobedient, thinking you always know more than Jesus. If you would just do what Jesus would tell you to do, the heavens would open and you would see the miracles take place. But instead, you want to question everything because you are still too rebellious. You just want, see, Jesus does what the Father Jesus does stuff that makes no sense. Why does he do it? Well, the father told him. Does Jesus question, well, what, the man's blind. How, how is putting mud with spit in it going to help his blindness? That doesn't make any sense to me, father. I mean, shouldn't I just do something? Shouldn't I, shouldn't I put some chemicals in his eyes? Jesus doesn't ever question what the Father tells him. You question what Jesus tells you to do all the time. No wonder he doesn't do any miracles for you. Rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. So if Jesus, if, if, this, if this situation where you were one of the servants, he would simply look at you after saying, water, I don't need any water. We're out of wine. We need some wine. Why, why, why are you asking for water? Jesus would say, shut up and go get the water and take it to the head waiter. And you know what happens. The head waiter says, look, everyone puts the best wine first. But instead, you put the best wine last. In fact, we've never had wine on this level. This is the best we have ever tasted. Does anyone know that Jesus did the miracle? Nobody. Except the servants. Because he could not reveal his ministry to yet go public. But his disciples, they see it. And you've got to understand, Nate's saying, oh, God, just like he told me, I called him the son of God. But he said, no, I'm the latter, son. And as the latter, I will only work as the son of man. You will see angels doing my bidding, but only as the son of me. Oh, God, help me. I keep going past things. I, I got to end. Everyone say, time to end. I like Burger King. And when I'm really starving, I will even go to McDonald's. I know this is bad food. But when I go, let's say McDonald's, because that's where a lot of you go. <laughs> Wendy's, Burger King, I mean, there's several. You have to make three stops. <laughs> and so the first stop, I uh, go up where there's a speaker and a voice says, uh, uh, can I take your order, please? And uh, what the speaker, I mean, I don't see the person that's talking to me. May I take your order? Never see them. And so, McDonald, I want a number nine, please. All right. And so, uh, then I go from there to window number one. And in window number one, they want me to pay them for what I just ordered because what I just ordered is what I need because I'm hungry. And so at window number <coughs> one, <coughs> I have to pay them, correct? Yes or no, right? And after I pay them, then I can go to window number two. And at window number two, they will hand me a bag with what I ordered. And hopefully, they will get the order correct. <laughs> now, I understand that I can't go to window number two to start with. Because if I go to window number two, I haven't paid my money at window number one. And I haven't placed my order in the first stop with the voice that I didn't see. 
And so I can't go to first, window two. I can't. So if I jump in line and push, it does me no good. And even going to window number one does me no good because I have to tell what I want. Why am I telling you this? That's a good question. When you make your prayer request known to God, it's like taking the first step. I'm speaking to a voice I don't see. And I'm telling him what I need. And I'm telling him what I want. Hmm. But I can't stop at that point. I have to go to window number one. And at window number one, they're going to ask me a question. And the question is, where's your money to pay for what you want when you were speaking to someone you didn't see? And if I understand my rights as a believer, then I understand that I will say to them, uh, my bill has already been paid. My bill has been paid by the Lord Jesus Christ. He has paid it all and all to him I owe. Sin has left its stain, but he has washed me white as snow. It's paid by the blood of Jesus Christ. Then I can move forward to window number two because window number two is where the Holy Spirit just delivers and delivers, where he opens the windows of heaven and the angels are at my disposal to take that which needs to go up, the request to heaven, and then to bring the answer on the Son of Man back. And at window number two, the Holy Spirit just does the miraculous. And I don't even have to make other people aware of what he's done because I want to just see the miracles happen in my life. I have been given all authority. He is the Son of Man. He is the Son of God. Both the Son of Man, the Son of God reside inside of me. What is it that you need? What is it that you want? Make your request known. Go to the next step and say, it's been paid by the blood of Christ. And then watch the Holy Spirit do it. Do not doubt. Do not waver. Do not guess at thinking, will this happen? God is as good as his word, but stop expecting it to happen in heaven. Heaven has to come down to earth. It's got to be in earth as it is in heaven. Things have to happen here. Stop always wanting to go to heaven. The action is down here. When are you gonna get off your butt and see what God can do through you by his delivery service, by the post office of the angels, there is nothing impossible to him to believe. You can speak to the mountain and the mountain must move. If, if, if you will believe in your heart, it has to happen. Stand on your feet and give God some glory. If you haven't already liked this video, subscribe to the YouTube channel and comment. Whatever sticks out to you today, comment it down below. Help someone else be able to apply the word of God to their life as well.